OK, so in this video, I want to explore what the second derivative can tell us. OK, so what I've done is I've drawn a curve. It has a little bit of a wibble wobble to it. OK, but what I've done is I've identified where the curve is stationary, where dy by dx is zero. So we know that stationary points exist when the first derivative is zero. And that's where I've identified them. OK, now these two points here, OK, um, well, they look fairly familiar to us. This is what we would refer to as a local maximum. OK, so that's a local maximum because it's not the maximum, of course, because the curve shoots off to infinity there. So it doesn't actually have a maximum, but in the local vicinity, it is a maximum point. And likewise, we have a local minimum down here. OK, now what we've got here and here are both examples of what we would refer to as a stationary point of inflection. OK, so some people will just call it a point of inflection. But as we will find, um, points of inflection is a bit more of a broader term. So these two points here are referred to as stationary point of inflection. Okay. Right, so our job is to really be able to identify whether a point is a local maximum, a local minimum, or a stationary point of inflection. Okay, so on this picture, what we can see is that the gradient is changing as we go around our curve. Okay, so we're going here from a positive gradient to a negative gradient. Okay, and that is what is locating that local maximum. And then we're going from a negative gradient to a negative gradient again. Okay, so negative to negative is the stationary point of inflection. The local minimum, we're going from negative up to positive. So negative to positive is the local minimum. And then we've got positive to positive is a stationary point of inflection. So the stationary points of inflection could be negative to negative or positive to positive. OK, and likewise, local minimum is negative to positive. Local maximum is positive to negative. OK, so in this video, we are going to introduce the second derivative. OK, now the second derivative has its own peculiar notation. And the idea is that I want to differentiate dy by dx. OK, because I've got the y, I've differentiated that to get dy by dx, and I'm going to differentiate that again. OK, and in order to say that, well, I'm differentiating dy by dx. Now, dy by dx isn't a really a fraction, OK, uh, although we use that notation to interpret it. But the notation kind of comes from that for the second derivative, where we've got d of dy. So it's kind of like where the d times d. But it's, there's not affected what's going on. But that's kind of how the notations come about. So we say d squared y. And then you've got dx times dx, which is then dx squared. I mean, that's kind of the idea of where the notations come from. But it is this notation that we use for the second derivative, d2y by dx squared. That's often how people say it, rather than d squared y. So we say d2y by dx squared for the second derivative. OK, now, why would that be of importance? How would that tell us anything? OK, so let's say we've got uh, a curve that looks like this. OK. So here is, I don't know, maybe a cubic curve. And I differentiate that. So if I put in an x-axis now, and I'm going to differentiate that, and what happens is that those stationary points are now going to be 
where the first derivative, so this is dy by dx, this is where the first derivative is going to be crossing the x-axis. So we're going from positive gradient to negative gradient to positive gradient. So we're going above the x-axis, positive, negative, because we're below, then positive again. And that's why you get this cubic curve differentiating to a quadratic, OK? Because you're going from positive gradient to negative gradient to positive gradient. Positive, negative, positive. OK? Now, if you differentiate that again, OK, then if I put in an x-axis again, and this will be d2y by dx squared now, OK, so we're going to differentiate again, then the stationary point of that one will be where this one crosses the x-axis. And we're going from negative to positive. So negative to positive. And you can see why a quadratic will differentiate to a straight line. OK. Now, what's clear here is that if I have my stationary point here, which is a local maximum, if I substitute that into the second derivative, what I get is a value that is below the x-axis. And so I get a negative value. Whereas, if I substitute in a local minimum, I get a point that is above the x-axis, and so a positive value. So a local maximum, if I substitute in a stationary point, let's say a stationary point is x is a, or alpha, or something like that, OK? Then substituting it in to the second derivative, I'll actually get a negative value. OK? So that's when I've substituted in. So if I write it like this, I've substituted in the stationary point and I've got a negative value, that means we have a local maximum, as we can see from this little diagram. And likewise, if I substitute in the stationary point into my um, second derivative here, and I get a positive value, I have a local minimum. OK, so that is clear from my diagram how we've built that up. OK, and that is always the case. Now, that then means that we've got a little bit of a problem. Because what happens then if we've got something that could be negative or something that could be positive? What happens if I substitute in my stationary point, and I get 0. What happens then? Well, does that mean it's a stationary point of inflection? I mean, that would be the obvious choice, isn't it, right? That would be the obvious choice, because um, it would fit in very nicely if that was the case. Now, what you need to know is that that is not the case. OK, that is not enough to identify whether you have a stationary point of inflection. And I'll give you an example. Well, I'll give you two examples. OK, first example is if we look at y equals x cubed. OK, now y equals x cubed, we know what that one looks like. OK, so y equals x cubed looks like that. OK, so clearly at 0, there is this stationary point of inflection. OK? Now, if I differentiate that, we get 3x squared. To find the stationary point, we put the dy by dx equal to 0. So 3x squared will be 0, which means that x would have to be 0, which is exactly what we thought. OK? That's at 0. Now, if I find the second derivative, that's 6x. Substitute the second derivative, sorry, substitute x is 0 into the second derivative, and I get 0. And so that would kind of seemingly confirm to us that if the second derivative is 0 at the stationary point, then we've got a point of inflection. Right, second example coming up. So let's say we looked at y equals x to the 4. 
Now y equals x to the 4 looks like that. OK, it's kind of like a parabola, but with a flatter bottom. OK, and steeper sides. So dy by dx is 4x cubed. So if I put the first derivative equal to 0, that finds me the stationary points. So 4x cubed will be 0, which means that x is 0. And so that is a stationary point. It's clearly not a point of inflection because we're going from negative to positive. And so it is a minimum, okay, a minimum point or local minimum or the minimum in this case. Now the second derivative is uh, 12x squared. Now if you substitute x is 0 into 12x squared, you get 0. So in this case, substituting x is 0 into the second derivative got me 0 again. But this time, it's definitely a, a minimum, whereas here it was definitely a point of inflection. So actually, if I substitute into the second derivative, the, the, a stationary point, and I get 0, it could be a local minimum. It could be a point of inflection. If you'd done it with y equals uh, minus x to the 4, you would have got a maximum. So actually, if the second derivative is 0 when x, uh, at a stationary point, then you know nothing. You, there's no information gained. Okay? You, it doesn't tell you anything. It could be any type of stationary point that you like. Okay, so that means that if this is the case, we could have a local maximum, we could have a point of inflection, or a local minimum, or that stationary point of inflection. We don't know. Could be any of those. Okay, so that is where the second derivative test. Uh, really breaks down, okay? And we have to do more investigative work in order to figure out what type of stationary point it is. Thankfully, you can use the first derivative to check, okay? So let's say that I know that this point is uh, x equals 1, okay? That's got x coordinate of 1. So um, what I would have found is the second derivative at x is 1 is 0. Okay? Now, to determine what type of stationary point it is, if you substitute a point either side of 1, as long as it's reasonably close and not, um, not past another stationary point, so let's say 0.9 and 1.1. If you substitute 0.9 and 1.1 in, you would get a negative value and then a negative value. And so you'd be able to tell that either side of the stationary point, the first derivative is negative. And so you're going from negative to negative, and so it must be a stationary point of inflection just like that. If we'd looked at that, and that was x is 1, and you'd gone from uh, negative to positive, that means you've got a local minimum, negative to positive. If you've got positive to negative, then it's a positive to negative, and so it's a local maximum. So you can use the first derivative, either side of your stationary points, to determine what types they are as well. OK? Um, in the next video, I'm going to progress with all of these ideas and go a little bit further, okay? But beyond this point is full A-level material and not AS material.